I was going to say good morning. But good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all here for our afternoon Lenten service. And you know why the clergy decided to have it at 4 o'clock instead of 7? Because we're all older and we shouldn't be driving at night. You know that story, don't you? <laughs> well, no matter how dangerous or safe you are on the road, we're glad you're here and worshiping with us. Whether you're here or whether you're at home listening over the telephone conference call or Zoom. And we do have those facilities available. Um, I want to thank all the churches who are here tonight, and I'm going to do that in the form of an ad for the next worship services that are coming up in this series, because as you know, we have five all together. So next Sunday the 13th, we are at Bethel United Church of Christ, where uh, Pastor Zoe Dahani is going to be talking about the theme from the hymn uh, what wondrous love is this? Because during this Lenten season, we're doing hymn themes. Uh, our theme tonight is In Christ I Stand, or In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone, yes, I've got to get that right. Uh, next Sunday, uh, 20th rather, we're at St. David's Sherman's, and uh, Reverend Scott Sager is going to uh, base his service on uh, what When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And then on the 27th, the host church is going to be St. Paul's Dubs, and that's Reverend Susan Fritz, and the hymn is, the Lord is Christ the Lord, Christ the Lord is risen today. I can't read my own typing, isn't that bad? And uh, on the April 3rd, the host church is going to be St. Bartholomew's United Church, E-L-E-C-L-A, and the pastor is Reverend Stephen Thomas. Well, Let's see, we have our worship leaders here. Come on up, Mike and Gail. And uh, the communion table doubles as a really good podium uh, for large groups. This, does all the pages in our order of worship mean the service is going to be long, Matt, uh, Mike? No, not at all. Not at all, not at all. Just right. Just right. Yeah. Oh. Jonas, that's a prelude. Oh, that's right, yes. thank you. Uh, our, Organist and choir director Jonas Sterner up there on the organ is going to play a prelude for us. And you, you folks can go sit back down if you want. Do you want to sit down? Yeah. Okay. We are told in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter and the 58th verse. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Sometimes we are amazed at the way the Lord helps us. Trust in Jesus. Live his love. Share the hope and promises that the Christ has given us. At other times, we become afraid, indifferent, or self-centered. We want to stand firmly in the ways of Christ. But do not live out our beliefs. Let us gather and seek out the ways that Christ might help us to follow him. Join 
us in worship together, singing. You may be seated. You, you deserve a rest. You sang so beautifully, and what a sense of, of congregation when we all sing together like that. It was beautiful. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, it is such a privilege for us all to be gathered together tonight in a world where a lot of folks don't go to church and a lot of people don't even have a sense of faith. How wonderful that we can gather together like this to support one another to sing those hymns out loud, one with another, to allow that faith in Christ, that power of his spirit, to penetrate into our lives. We ask that you bless the ministry of each of the churches gathered here. May it move out into this world that needs to hear the encouraging words about the Lord. 
may we be willing to do what is uncomfortable and share our faith. May we gather others, even those contrary family members, to be part of the church and, and come close to you. Dear Lord, on this night when we are concerned about what's happening in Ukraine, we pray that you will be with those courageous folks from that country and support them in their efforts to be free and to resist oppression. And Lord, be with each person here who deals with sadness in their life or loss or challenges or simply needs your encouragement. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Your turn, sir. And ma'am. Are there any additions to be made to the prayer list? Okay, I see none. This evening we would pray for Reverend Phyllis Baum, Bob Bixler, Joe Black, Chris Elliott, Jan Fry, Gloria Henry, Jane Miller, Jane Nace, Greg and Sandra Puderball, Jean Sterner, Mike Sterner, Reverend Kurt and Ginny Weber, Phyllis Werner, and the family and friends of Donna Derrett, Marlene Collins, Floyd Groff, Eric Harlacher, Harold Horst, Mike Neller, Eileen Naif, Deb Ort, Buddy Overlander, Joel Solomon, Sandra Spangler, Phyllis Toman, Kathy Trimmer, and Gary Weinholt. That is a very long prayer list because that's only part one. Part two is coming along a little later and it means so much to people that you pray for them and we are so grateful for your prayers. Let us share together the prayer our Lord taught us as we read and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Father who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This evening, we can share our offerings for this ecumenical service. We have a plate placed at the rear along the, the glass paneled wall back here. There's on a stand, there's a plate, and it's marked church. Please, at your will, place your offering there. Our offerings for the service will go to the empowering work of the Hanover Area Council of Churches. come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are grateful that we can work together to support the ministries of the Hanover Area Council of Churches. We are so grateful that they feed the hungry, house the homeless, and help to give encouragement to those who are down and out in their lives. And that we are able to do wondrous things together for others that we wouldn't be able to do on our own. Bless this ministry. We are so grateful that not only the churches, but individuals in the community have come forward to support so generously 
this good work that we do in the name of your Son. As we give our offerings, we ask that you bless them and make the work of the Council continue to be powerful and helpful in our greater community. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, you may be seated. children please come forward for tonight's children's story or is it afternoon's children's story I gotta think about that a little bit come on down well let's see who's here tonight what's your name sir Elijah Elijah Maggie Maggie 
So I wanted to know if there's anything you have had to learn. Is there anything you can think of you had to, had, had to learn? Um, yes. I think I know one. You have been learning to play the violin, is that right? Yes, that is true. And, and do you um, take lessons? Yes. And do you have to practice? Yes. And is there anything Elijah has been learning to do that he has to practice? Can no. You think? No. That's coming up soon. Yep. Like sometimes, can you think of things that people do and they have to practice them? Like, um, do people play sports sometimes? Do you see ball players on TV playing sports or basketball players? Do you think they had to practice to learn that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. They did. They did. So, did you know that when Jesus' disciples, you know, the guys who followed Jesus, when they came along, did you know they didn't know how to do everything that he wanted them to know how to do? He, they didn't. How did they learn, do you think? Jesus taught them. They practiced. Yes, they did. And they, what do you think they practiced? Any idea? Um, what did Jesus do? Did he preach to people? Did he? Yes. Did, did he, um, what else did Jesus do? Did he? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know? Well, let me tell you, okay. He, he preached to people. He told them about God. Yeah. He healed people. Yeah. 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 And he raised people from the dead. And that's something. I've not seen that in my day, but he did. And that's pretty neat, isn't it? So, so Jesus' disciples had to learn to preach people, to preach to people and heal people and baptize people. All that he did, they did. So if they can learn to be better people of God, we can learn by practicing it. Yep. So can you remember that? Sometimes to do things that are good, you have to really practice them. Like, yeah, yeah like, like your violin, I bet that when you first started playing the violin, it sounded pretty creaky, made funny noises. Did actually, no. No. Good, actually. You started out pretty yeah. good. Wow, yeah. I am very impressed because when I played the violin, it made the dog howl. Well, it did, well, but you know better, right? So, um, well, so, uh, well, yeah, it does. Sound a little creaky. Yeah, sometimes it comes out creaky, he's saying, Elijah's saying, yes. So anyway, remember as followers of Jesus, sometimes the things we do come out a little creaky, but the more we practice them, the better it gets. Okay? Thank you so much for being here. I always appreciate it. Notice how quickly they get up. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor Bruce, were you, did you practice your flexibility? How do you get up and down? <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> Can you all remember when we were 50 or 60 or maybe 70 years ago and we could scoot back and forth that swiftly? <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? Let us look to God's word. This evening, uh, the first scripture from Proverbs, the third chapter, and verses five through six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Remember, the Lord is in everything you do, and he will show you the right way. A second scripture from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the lake while he sent the people away. After sending the people away, he went up a hill by himself to pray. When evening came, Jesus was there alone. And scripture from the second book of Timothy, the first chapter and the seventh verse. For the spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, his spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. Thank you, Mike and Gail, for sharing those scriptures. 
So as I was sharing, the clergy, when we got together to talk about what's our theme for this year, we thought we'd each choose a special hymn in order to talk about it, because hymns often have a powerful message. And the one that our church uh, chose, it is called In Christ Alone. And I would like to read to you the first stanza, uh, just, to, just to refresh our memories, because sometimes when we sing things, it kind of goes by pretty quickly, doesn't it? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm from the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Isn't that a powerful hymn? What a declaration of our faith that we have this faith to stand in in Christ, that Christ has forgiven our sins and he has taught us how to be these people of faith. At the same time, as this is Lent and the season when we think about following Jesus better, do we always measure up? Do we always allow Christ to be our solid ground, our cornerstone? Are we always firm in that love of Christ? Sometimes not. And I think I found the culprit why we aren't always that way. Now, you, you might say, the devil made me do it. An evil spirit caused me to be a bad person. Or, all the other kids got the goodness genes and I got the mean genes or the evil genes, right? Or, maybe it was something else. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just indifferent and I don't care. Well, sometimes people are. But I think it's something else. I think often we do things out of habit. We do things the same way all the time. And scientists tell us that this is a mechanism wired into our brain. Because when you get up in the morning and you have to change into your clothing, I don't always think about what I'm doing. I just know that both feet eventually get in the pants, you know, and the shirt goes around me and all that, and, and that's a good thing. But what, that, what it is, is our brains have learned a routine, a habit, and it gets wired into us so we don't even have to think about it. Let, let me tell you how powerful this can be. When I was living in Hanover and I was a pastor there, the hospital wasn't that far away from the church and where we lived. And back in those days, before the pandemic and even several years before that, people usually stayed in the hospital for a few days. And I think our church at the time must have uh, built a wing on that hospital for all the number of times people were in that hospital and, and being taken care of. So usually I would go to the hospital every day. So take a Saturday morning when Rita and I, my wife and I were going somewhere else, um, I would discover that we get into this really interesting conversation on the way to wherever and the car would drive itself to the hospital. We'd be sitting in the parking lot. Rita would say, why are we here? There's, you said nobody's in here today, from the church anyway. I said, oh yeah, just force of habit, right? Or um, I bet when some of you came here tonight and greeted your friends, did you say good morning instead of good afternoon or good evening? Last Wednesday, we had an Ash Wednesday service and I even had the old service from the Sunday before out and started reading from that, and I was saying good, good morning to everybody. It's just a force of habit. Or here's one. A friend of mine told me this very interesting story. He and his wife moved to a new apartment, and they had a couple of small children, and uh, it was Saturday night at 10 o'clock, and their little girl suddenly comes out of the bedroom and she heads over and she sits on her father's lap and suddenly he decide, finds his lap is getting very wet and warm. And the little girl had traced the exact route out of the bedroom to where the bathroom was in their earlier apartment, sat down and the rest is history. <laughs> Force of habit, right? And this is often the way it is when we react to situations. Scientists also tell, tell us that we have various levels in our brain, and the lowest, most primitive level is reptilian. 
and it's really reacting to situations kind of out of reflex. So, for example, if you're walking down a dark alley in a city some night, and this guy starts running towards you, screaming at the top of his lungs, uh, flashing a blade of steel, uh, you might not sit around and ask how the wife and kids are. You know, you might just get out of there as fast as you can uh, if you have the legs to carry you, and you might stand and fight if you have the strength, or if you're old like me, you might just freeze in panic and not know what to do when the guy probably stabs us, right? So, because that's a primitive reaction to situations. And what happens often is if people are in those sorts of situations where they're feeling uncomfortable or they're not feeling they're able to think through the matter, often we go back to reacting as we always have been. So we may be very nice in church on Sunday and then during the week at work if somebody's mean to us, we may give them a piece of our mind and tell them exactly what we think. Not exactly in a Christian way because that's we're going back to that reptilian kind of fear or fight kind of situation, right? So how do we get beyond that? There's a wonderful story in the New Testament where Jesus does exactly that. The story begins as Jesus and his disciples have gone near the border of what would be Syria today, but it was near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. And these people who lived in those places were considered the enemy. They were richer, a lot richer, than the people who lived in Israel, which made them jealous that they didn't have the stuff that the Syrians had. They worshiped pagan gods, which made them feel that these people were, you know, kind of akin to the devil and, and, and unclean. And so they really weren't very welcomed. So who comes to visit Jesus and gets down on her knees and begs Jesus to heal her daughter because her daughter is sick at home and, and she fears she's going to die. And this woman to Jesus and his disciples would be a threatening presence. It would be somebody who's had it good all their life where the Jewish people have had it really hard and we're not gonna help them. And Jesus says to her in a very uncharacteristic way of Jesus talking, he says, it isn't right for me to give the children's food and give it to the dogs. Now, if you didn't quite get what he was saying there, he's basically saying, woman, I came to help the people of Israel, the children of Israel, to give them healing and such, and I'm not gonna help a Syrian dog, namely you and your daughter. That's pretty horrible, isn't it? But his disciples were probably saying, Yay, Jesus, you tell her for, you tell her what's up. Those Syrian people have had it good for too long, too bad for them, right? Because that's how sometimes people respond when they're in a situation of stress, not at their best. But the woman knows her daughter is sick and Jesus is the only one who could heal her. So she's not going to fight with him. She's not going to argue with him. She doesn't even argue that she might be a dog. She says to Jesus, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Did you hear that? Even the dogs get the crumbs. What is she saying? She's saying, I might be a dog, but even the crumbs of your power, Jesus, are enough to heal my daughter. That's all we need, just the crumbs. Jesus is really impressed. He hasn't seen faith like that even in Israel. This woman is ready to believe in him even though she doesn't even believe in his God, but she believes in him. She believes that he can heal her and make such a difference. So he says, what you have asked will be done. Go home, your daughter is made well. Isn't that a powerful story? Jesus could take a situation that might have just triggered his normal reaction of the culture of his time to tell this woman off, and she sees, he sees her faith, his heart goes out to her in sympathy, and he gives her what she needs, and she, he sees her in a whole different way. Now, can we do things like that? Can, when we're in a stressful situation, can we 
get beyond our normal way of operating. Well, let me tell you a story about Rita, my wife, what happened to her once. Many years ago, late 80s, early 90s, my wife was driving to college in Baltimore. And um, she went to class, as she did a couple evenings a week. And this young woman came to class, a student, and said, oh, my car ran out of gas. It's quite a ways from here. Could anyone drive me to a gas station, get some gas, and fill up the tank with me? Rita said, I'll do it, sure. So after class, Rita drove the woman to find a gas station, filled up a tank, and brought it to the car. She helped her fill the gas tank of the car. Now, what was interesting is that in this neighborhood where this woman was parked, it did not look like the safest place to be. And Rita had to park up a little ways from the woman's car to find a place to park. And so as soon as the woman had gas in her tank, she took off out of there, leaving Rita all by herself. And suddenly, these five, five guys looking very large and strong and ominous came up to Rita and said, ma'am, you should not be here. It is not a safe place to be. And I don't think she was feeling any safer because they said that. And they said to her, and so she had a, a, an opportunity to fight them, which would have been no battle. She was petite, and they would have just overtaken her in no time at all, or to outrun them, and she never would have outrun them. Or she could have just frozen and panicked, but what she did is she thought through. What would I want someone to say to me if I was the one who had all the power? And she said, that is so nice of you to think of me. I really appreciate that. And then one of the men said, let me have your keys and I'll open the door for your car and we'll help you out. And she said, that is so kind of you. I really appreciate it. Here's my keys. And they walked her to the car and they opened the door and they gave her the keys back. And she said, you gentlemen have been so kind to me tonight. I really appreciate it. And they said, bye, ma'am. She said, goodbye. And she drove off. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I, I mean, that's really, really being calm in a very stressful situation and treating someone as a Christian. Now, how can we do that? Let me tell you another story. This is a story about my son. When my son went to Penn State many years ago, he had taken the piano ever since he was about seven years old. He really loved the piano. And more than that, he loved to practice which as a child when I took the piano, I didn't love to practice. My teacher used to say to me, my piano teacher, I'm just wasting your mother's money here. But my son loved to practice and he did. So when he went to Penn State, there was this contest among piano players and he had the opportunity, if he won the contest, to play this 23 page piece of music by a famous, well, I don't know if it's a famous composer, a very, gifted composer by the name of Dahanye. I'm not sure if that's right, but it's close. And uh, you know, it's one of those pieces of music where it looks like somebody took ink and just splattered it all over the page because there were all these little dots. It was just massive. And he had to learn 20 pages of it, okay? 23, whatever it was. So he's playing this concert piece with the Penn State Orchestra backing him up. And about halfway through, he discovered that they were falling apart. They were all in different places and different measures. So he made up a piece of that music and played it extra loud so that they would all catch up with him. And they did. And they finished the piece. And if you didn't know the music really, really well, you never would have known the difference. Now, how did he do that? He practiced. He had spent his life practicing music. Whenever he had a piece of music to learn, his piano teacher wanted him to memorize it so there'd be no pages of music before him. And that's what he did for this particular piece. So he was ready to deal with that situation and he could be very cool and calm about it. Is it possible that we can practice our Christian faith? And it's important because sometimes we are in situations like Rita was, where we're really under fire. 
And, and let me give you another example of what may, might make it difficult. Let's suppose Rita was not the one who was on that street and fearful. Let's suppose it was another woman and growing up, she'd been beaten up by the bullies in her neighborhood constantly. Even her brother and sister picked on her and beat her up. And she had a history of that kind of trauma where when you're in a situation like that, how do you feel when you've had trauma in your life? Well, it's like a little videotape goes off in your head and you are back there again. You're six or seven years old, the kids are, are, are surrounding you, they beating you up, they're treating you horribly, and you're a powerless little kid. And that's what trauma does. So often people who have had trauma of any kind, car accident, being beaten up, long sickness, anything, it's very easy for that videotape to go off in your head and you're back there. And so it's real important to practice our Christian faith during those situations we might face. Because scientists also tell us that often in terms of interacting with a situation which might be frightening, there's often what they call a window of opportunity. There's a chance that we are not too scared in certain situations, but if it's too overwhelming for us, we are. And we, we react in the whole habitual way. But every time we face a situation that makes us afraid or angry or triggers us in some way, what if we stretch ourselves and try to do the right thing when we don't feel comfortable doing it? So if you don't feel comfortable talking to people who have come to church, give it a try. Talk to the person you don't know and, and find out their name. Or if you're not comfortable, prying money out of your wallet to help those in need, and I've got all my money glued to the bottom of my wallet, then, then practice giving small amounts and working your way up so you're comfortable helping other people. And if you're not comfortable forgiving people who have hurt you, start off small and talk to the people that hurt you and get a conversation going and, and make it like you're trying to be at least their friend. And you'll find that forgiveness becomes easier as you take each step to be that kind person. We heard a beautiful hymn tonight in Christ alone and about how we stand with the Lord and the Lord stands with us and we are ready to face any situation just by following him and trusting in him. He is our savior, the one whose grace has given us forgiveness. We are saved by him. And sometimes we don't act that way, but we can if we face our life in those situations where we don't measure up to what we want to be in following Christ. And we take each small step to be that better person. We make a habit of following Jesus and get stronger each day and try new ways of following him so that we can be more truly one who belongs to the Lord. And now our worship leaders, Mike and Gail Sterner, which I don't think I introduced you before. That's Mike and Gail Sterner. Anyway, they are going to read part two of our prayer list, which will also be put up on the screen. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks, Gail. As we share these uh, requests, uh, they've come in many ways to us at Stone Church. They've been shared during the Sunday school hour at worship. We've received phone calls and have just gathered them together. So they may be, you'll see they're on by a date, maybe by a week, and that helps us track uh, how long they've been on the list, but that we continue to pray for them. I would also ask, <clears throat> excuse me, that as we uh, begin to share these continued uh, requests this evening, um, your unspoken prayers, do not be shy and lift them before the Lord. Uh, prayers requested on February the 27th 
We're praying for Saren Boring and Joan Grosskost and Tony Heiss. Praying, praying for Dustin Miller and Lori Miller and Shirley Miller and Mary Lou and Donald Meckley. Prayers for Paige Creel and family, Baby Riley, Gary Rohrball, Shirley Russell, Jackie Toman, and Joyce and Tom Whitcraft. On Sunday, February 20th, 20th we shared the name of Gail Ambrosius, Cindy Breeden, Kevin Crum, Cassie Egan and family, Michael Hershey, Cordelia Kepler, Dolores Markle, Micah Miller, Willis Miller, Pat Palmer, Pete Renzulli, Zane Smith, Doug Sonleitner, Zachary Worley, Cecilia Williams, and Cheryl Zumbrum. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And prayers that were requested on February 13th, continuing in prayer for Angela Cox and Ray Jean Crone, Steve Forbes, Wayne Frock, Lester Heckler, Chip Hoover, Richard Lukabal, Joseph Mongluzo, Dorothy Nagash, Kaylee Noble, Dean Rohrbach, praying for Mike Shriver and Deb Sell and Eric Sherman, prayers for Reverend Charles Strasball, Evan Taylor, Beverly Trump, Dorothy Trump, and Reverend Leonard Warner, and praying for Dennis Weikert and Shirley Zumbrum. And those we keep in our continued prayers, Robert Anstein, Gary Clapper, James Diem, Dennis Fawzi, Todd Gladfelder, Cindy Helmers, Joan Hensel, Mark Hirsch, Dolores Jones, Warren Lockman, Ray Leaphart, James Miller, Lisa Myers, Bob Ottstadt, George Rankin Sr., Mike Schmidt, Beverly Spate Muhammad, Kathy Rohrbaugh, Sharon Schuler, Summer Storm, Matt Strevig, Shari and Kenyon Taylor, Reverend Dr. David Stewart, Richard Brett Wilkinson, Kim Wilson, the worst workers exposed to COVID. Shall be bright at last. 
I fear my faith will fail. Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail. He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me Let us share the benediction together. And may God, the source of patience and encouragement, enable you to have the same point of view among yourselves. By following the example of Christ Jesus, so that all of you together may praise with one voice, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
be seated. Just a couple of announcements for tonight. I want to remind you again that we're going to be at Bethel United Church of Christ next Sunday, the 13th at 4 p.m. If you come at 7, we'll all be gone home by then, I'm sure. So 4 p.m. Also, uh, for those of you at home who are connected by Zoom or by the uh, telephone conference call, same connection uh, next week as this week. Also, uh, our flowers today are given to the glory of God and in honor of the birthday of Jonas Sterner, our organist and pianist and vocalist, and also uh, his birthday was the 15th of February, and Mike and Gail Sterner, who were our worship leaders this, mor this evening, say I went to morning, but this evening, and uh, uh, that, w that happened on the 19th, I think. Yes, the 19th of February, and it was done by Mindy and Maggie and Elisha Sterno, you saw the children up at the children's story. They're the ones with the deep pockets around here and they got the flowers with their mom. Thank you, that was very nice, yay, okay. And we thank all the people who helped in our service, including our folks who were at the uh, sound and video desk back there, including Kevin Barnhart, Son Jake, and also uh, Taylor Thacker is up there and I thought I saw her Father Ray, there he is, he's back at the tissue box from where I'm standing. Okay, good. Thank you folks for keeping us in, in videos and slides and all that's most appreciated. And Jonas is now going to play as a postlude, What Wondrous Love. And we'll see you next week over at Bethel. Thank you. <laughs> 